aerospace applications, the the general principles are all the same that you would have in any kind of electronics design. So the stack up that you want is the same that's going to be used to control signal integrity, EMI. I think the, uh, the more unique thing is that in aerospace, unlike most consumer electronics, you're much more likely to have a conductive housing. So it's gonna be housed in metal, not just in plastic. And so you want to make sure in your stack up to take the relationship to the conductive structure around it into account in a way that you don't have to with handheld electronics. So uh, making sure that you've got sort of a landing area where the things that are gonna come in from the outside get uh, isolated and filtered before they come in um, because you really wanna keep that segregation between the inside environment and the outside environment. Other than that, the, uh, the stack up uh, principles are pretty much all the same. The threats that you have to protect against in aerospace are fairly extreme. So you've got all these radars that can be pointed at you. you can, you've got different space environmental effects if you're in one of the orbiting environments. And I've heard it said, I, I haven't verified myself, but uh, I have no reason to disbelieve uh, that the harshest electromagnetic environment on Earth is the deck of a naval aircraft carrier. So what you really need to be taking into account there is, again, it's that metal enclosure. Automotive doesn't have much of this and consumer electronics almost never if you can avoid it. But having that metal enclosure gives you really fantastic protection if you do it right. So electrical bonding isn't something that's taught very much. There's a really fantastic NASA standard. It's NASA standard 4003. Um, it was written back in the early 2000s. It's been updated and it is a fantastic reference. The other thing is that it's freely available. You can find copies of it anywhere. It's not one of those standards you have to pay for. If you have that, uh, take some of the guidance from that about making sure that you've got really good metal to metal contact, uh, making sure that your connectors are 360 degree metal contact to the thing that they're plugging into. Make sure that your shield terminations are just rock solid to that connector, to that enclosure. That's the thing that in these much more extreme electromagnetic environments that's really going to um, protect the electronics on the inside. So I've turned into a complete standards geek, uh, which means that becoming vice president of standards for the EMC Society has just been like, a perfect role for me. Um, aerospace standards and automotive standards have a lot in common because they are both uh, have in mind the idea of a mobile platform that's mostly made out of metal. So whether you're in a submarine or a satellite or a car, you know, generally speaking, you've got some steel, steel superstructure around you that's going to be moving down the road, right? There's no connection to like the earth. So that leads to very specific test setups. So for instance, unlike FCC testing, in aerospace and automotive, you're usually testing at one meter for radiated emissions. Uh, FCC is going to test at three to 10 meters. The, the advantage to that is that, you know, as you pack things very close together on a car or a satellite or an aircraft, that kind of one meter testing captures that relationship really nicely. But um, it, the downside to that is that if you have something that's FCC compliant, you can't assume that it's going to be compliant for automotive or aerospace and vice versa. So the fact that that kind of cuts down on the certifiability <laughs> is uh, a little bit unfortunate um, because you know what we all want is to be able to take COTS equipment, so commercial off the shelf, and plug it right into an aerospace program because that would reduce costs so much but the testing methods are very different. And so it does mean that you have to um, uh, sign up to potentially redo testing, which you know, nobody wants, unfortunately. But in terms of, you know, we're all going for the same thing. So it's radiated susceptibility, it's radiated emissions. Um, it's just that the environments are different. And so the testing is a little different. Although honestly, one thing that I've always found interesting is that automotive testing is often harsher than aerospace. Um, and it's because they don't know what crazy places people will drive. <laughs> um, they, uh, you know, in an aerospace uh, program, especially if it's a satellite, right? You know the satellite, it's going to go to a launch site, it's going to get put on a launch rocket, it's going to wa get launched into a very specific orbit. It's not going to go wandering off into Jupiter orbit just on a whim. But man, people will drive crazy places and get themselves stuck in very strange ways. Actually, I had a friend who, uh, he drove up to the top of a, a mountain to get a really good view with a rental car, drove up right next to the big antenna repeater station, and the key fob wouldn't respond, the car wouldn't respond to the key fob anymore. <laughs> and 
It's like, what do you do? Uh, luckily, he was an EMC guy, and so he knew that if he just get hitting it, it would probably, t the timing would line up eventually, where there'd be like a microsecond where it wasn't being interfered with by the huge tower. But so he was able to eventually get off the mountain. But um, those kind of interference things in automotive and honestly in consumer electronics, um, you know, there's an unpredictability to it uh, where the aerospace world can be a little more controlled. On the other hand, again, if you are you know, going to be in a fighter jet on the deck of a naval aircraft carrier, you know, we're, it's going to get blasted to within an, an, an inch of its life. So this is actually a place where simulation works out really well. And I should add that in the automotive electric vehicle realm, you get fairly similar threats. So the idea is that uh, lightning, ESD, high intensity radiated fields, a lot of times they're relatively low frequency. And by low frequency there, we mean, you know, less than like 100 megahertz. Um, the same thing in electric vehicles, the switching noise from the big high power uh, components like the inverter or the DC-DC, uh, those are going to be switching in the hundreds of kilohertz, uh, tens to hundreds of kilohertz, and then you've got your harmonics going into those 10 to 100 megahertz. So the nice thing about that is that you can simulate a whole platform at a relatively large mesh size when you're dealing with frequencies in that range. And so you can really take a look, you know, uh, you can simulate with a full wave 3D solver, um, you know, an entire radar pulse hitting an entire car or structure or aircraft and seeing where do the currents get manifested? How do those, you know, then penetrate through shielding into electronics on the inside? What kind of test levels do you have to set? That kind of uh, simulation and validation is very mature. And um, I would encourage um, pretty much everybody to look into it if that's the kind of threat you're designing for. One thing that I'm hoping is that people in the automotive world, again, now that we're dealing with electric vehicles, usually we know some things about the high voltage system fairly early in the design process. You generally, you're gonna procure those uh, parts, those suppliers, you're gonna lock those down pretty early uh, because you're gonna build the rest of the car around that. And so, you know, you know your switching frequencies, you know your power draw, you can use that to drive a simulation fairly early in the design phase and see where you might have problems. See if there's places where rerouting cables would make more sense for your design. I think that if we can take some of those aerospace modeling applications and, you know, adopt them a little bit more in the automotive industry, especially for EVs, the threat environments are have a surprising amount of overlap and the modeling and simulation techniques, again, are, are very useful and very mature. So, it's, it's actually pretty easy because it's mil standard 461 versus RTCA DO160. And I know way too many of those numbers right off the top of my head. They've followed each other very closely, but there are some places where they're still different. So again, I think part of it has to do with those, that unpredictability. Part of it has to do with the fact that military uh, aircraft actually, again, just like we were saying cars can, people can drive cars in crazy ways. Commercial aircraft actually are more likely to get hit with bad weather than military. Uh, military can say, hey, there's lightning, you know, huge thunder and lightning storms between, you know, us and our operational point. We're just gonna hold off a couple days. Whereas commercial, sometimes, you know, that weather will come up while they're in the air or what have you, and, you know, they have to get where they're going. The testing standards are very similar and generally speaking, unlike commercial electronics to military, uh, if you've got something that's, that's been certified for civilian aircraft or military aircraft, they're probably gonna be good uh, going the other way. But uh, I was just uh, learning, uh, diving into earlier this week, actually, commercial aviation and automotive still use a test method called chattering relay that the military standard has actually moved away from. Um, when I was working in automotive, I would hear people complain, ah, that test's not very repeatable. And they're right, and that's why military standards moved away from it, but it is very representative of real world conditions on those platforms, on aircraft and cars, um, but not so much on, say, spacecraft or rockets. So, um, you know, there's still those little differences, um, you know, that are, that are important for diehard geeks like myself, but, um, you know, generally speaking, there's a lot more common, uh, commonality there. Right, so there's a few different specialties that go into that kind of survivability. So, uh, especially for stuff that's going to go into space, there's, um, there's a lot more that you have to worry about in terms of radiation and high energy particles. 
So there you're worried about things like single event upsets, you know, different kinds of ESD threats as a spacecraft is going through the plasma environment up in low Earth orbit. It you know, can build up charge in different ways than it would down here. And if you haven't done all your electrical bonding correctly, then you can get into a situation where you've got you know, severe discharges. We used to see this especially on solar arrays. Uh, where if the solar rays didn't have a nice uh, bit of conductive coating, uh, charge would just build up, build up, build up as it was orbiting, and then zot in to the electronics on the inside of the panel and shorten the lifespan of the, the spacecraft because you know it's not getting as much power as it's supposed to. So some of the things are really, it, it gets back to that principle of good electrical bonding. And again, NASA handbook 4003 is a great reference for that. Uh, NASA handbook 4002, is great for space charging environments. The other thing that you really need to look at, and this is true in a lot of these different applications, automotive as well, sometimes your design for, for these kind of threats comes down to software as much as it does to hardware. Uh, because it, you want to make sure that a single, a single event upset, like a single cosmic ray, isn't going to disrupt your entire thing. And in automotive, as you're bouncing down the road, especially as cars age, all those wires in pins in the connectors, they loosen up over time. So especially there was one test where we basically called it the bad pothole test. You know, if you hit one bad hot pothole and your car's already six or seven years old, you know, there's gonna be a moment of time where the pins kind of bounce out of the socket and then back in, or it can happen. The way to survive that is, is to have really robust uh, software so that, you know, either uh, it can paper over a little bit of a power disconnect or it can reset itself without any interruption to functionality or to the user. Uh, and you see the same kind of thing in, in some space applications. Obviously we've got in space, we've got much more of the metal housing that is going to be more robust. You have to worry about um, enclosure thickness, depending on the environment that you're gonna be, be in. Again, how high energy particles, how thick can they penetrate given the, the orbit that you're in. So, you know, LEO, you've, you've, uh, a lot of that stuff is already attenuated, but if you're out at GEO, you're just gonna get hit, you need thicker shielding. I think people sometimes underestimate the importance of software in um, surviving especially radiated and conducted immunity and susceptibility threats. Yeah, man, it is switching, 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 and motors. Uh, <laughs> so in high voltage, in the high voltage uh, electronic system or power system of an electric vehicle, uh, the switching operations are really the number one noise threat because you know all switching operations generate electromagnetic noise. Even every little digital bit that turns on and off in your watch. Uh, even my dumb watch is going to generate just that itty bitty little bit of electromagnetic noise. Pico amps of, of current, that's, that's not that big a deal. But when you've got switching operations that are drawing 700 volts and 20 amps, and so now you're switching kilowatts of power, a little design flaw that you never would have noticed before is gonna just scream, electromagnetically speaking. The other thing is that motors, these big moving parts, they literally have permanent magnets and then they're wrapped in, in whole tons of copper wire. And then you've got the, the actual axle being turned. All those components have the potential to, again, put out uh, electromagnetic noise, especially uh, one thing we call bearing noise. So as uh, axles turn, there can be sparking uh, across the bearing from like the different mechanical elements just kind of rotating next to each other. For all of this, the number one protection is going to be bonding. So everything that you've got that's metal needs to be really, really well bonded. And again, it's something the automotive industry is not as used to as the aerospace industry has been, which is why I keep pointing everyone to, to the NASA handbook, because my goodness, it's just NASA handbook 4003. Um, just a, a wealth of very practical information about how to implement these depending on uh, the purpose of the electrical bonding, what the threat is. So uh, there's kind of a, a rule of thumb in aerospace. It's like, oh, everything has to be bonded, what we call class R, 2.5 milliohms, which is, I, I mean, it, it's achievable. You can, uh, if you've got flat metal to metal contact with nothing in between, you can absolutely uh, achieve that bonding. Um, and you need to, if you're controlling for high frequency radio frequency uh, communications, so GPS, S-band communications, uh, KA-band, so up in the 20 gigahertz communication links, 
you really need that kind of bonding. If you are mostly worried about bearing noise and switching noise from things that are switching at 20 kilohertz, you know, you probably don't actually need class R bonding. You don't need to tie yourself into knots to get 2.5 milliohms exactly. But knowing that you're dealing with those threats at those frequencies, you do need to have very good electrical continuity, you know, but maybe it only has to be half an ohm instead of milliohms. Maybe it's something you can measure a little bit easier. You do want to make sure that like there's no grease between an enclosure and the chassis that it's mounted to, because just that little bit of grease uh, can, can cause immense problems. Uh, so electrical bonding is one of the main ways of controlling the noise. Um, you've got your cable shielding. Again, if the shields are bonded well, they're going to give you a lot of help. And then the other thing is filtering, both on the, uh, the victims, so like your low voltage control networks, and your offenders, so your DC-DC converter and your inverters. Filtering at those high power applications is not as simple as it is for kind of everyday power supplies. There's, because the noise is so extreme uh, from these, you know, kilowatt systems, you're really looking at every little parallel path, every potential where it can jump to enclosure or jump off the board. It's going to take those paths in ways that a low power system just couldn't. So including filtering not only at the IO ports, which is where we usually recommend that we have them, but also closer to the actual switching elements can make a huge difference. Yeah, so between shielding and filtering, uh, especially in automotive, it's a yes and. <laughs> now, what you want is you want to have all your high voltage stuff shielded perfectly, which you're going to do anyway for safety, right? It's not like the, the normal shielding on a high voltage cable is not there for EMI control. It is there for personnel safety. Now, it can have EMI uh, beneficial impacts for EMI, so that's great again, if it's done right. So what you want is that, that high voltage stuff, you want to shield it for EMI purposes as best as you possibly can. And again, it's already there anyway. You're not adding any cost. And if you just do the design right up front, you get all the benefit with, again, no added cost. And the goal of that is so that you don't have to shield anything on the low voltage side. In a lot of OEMs, even in a high voltage electric vehicle, uh, the can lines are twisted but not shielded and they're fine. They, you know, if, if the uh, shielding implementation on the high voltage side is, is solid, you should not have to shield anything on the low voltage side. Now, you may want to add filtering, um, just knowing that there's more electromagnetic noise very close uh, than you would maybe in, an, in a traditional internal combustion engine vehicle. What I would tend to say is that best possible quality shielding on the high voltage side as little shielding as you can get away with on the low voltage side, because anytime you're adding shielding there, you are adding cost. It's not necessarily designed to use shielding. And anything that's housed in plastic, your shielding's not gonna be great to begin with. Like there's just only so good you can make that system. So on the low voltage side, if you do run into problems, adding filtering there is gonna be your better bet. Uh, you do still need to have filtering on the high voltage side. Again, anything that you can do to help the poor system where, again, you've got just kilowatts of power screaming at all these different crazy frequencies. Um, but, you know, I think that's probably the, the best way to go into the design process. And it's interesting, the, uh, the high frequency stuff, in a weird way, actually doesn't end up um, impacting design as much as you'd think. A lot of times the extremely high frequency stuff, like you're talking automotive radar, 66, 77 gigahertz, you know, that stuff just, it dies out relatively quick. Stuff at that very high frequencies, it, it attenuates itself, usually before it uh, has the opportunity to really interfere with electronics. But again, with more and more electronic functionality and more and more criticality of that electronic functionality, I, this is one of those places where it gets back to software. So there's a whole EMI design philosophy that we're starting to hear more and more about. It's called EMR. So that's EM resilience. And it's an active area of, of research, especially in Europe. And the idea is when you have these incredibly complex safety critical uh, computing systems on a, on a vehicle, you cannot test them in every single operating mode against every single threat. Somebody worked out that to, like, to do, even with a relatively you know, basic ADAS system, to try and do every operating mode at every frequency against every threat, it'd take longer than the age of the universe 
you know, something along those lines. And so you really need to be thinking again about software reliability, software robustness. So you kind of want to go in with the assumption that I'm going to be interfered with by stuff. Knowing that I'm going to be interfered with by stuff, how can I make my software more resilient and more redundant so that none of my functionality gets uh, knocked offline by that interference? That's one of those places where, again, you have to think about the whole system, uh, the hardware as well as the software, um, to ensure that you're going to get the, the maximum reliability that we all need for these kind of technologies to be successful. The main challenges are the same across all the industries. So radiated emissions, that's CISPR 25, CISPR 12, uh, CISPR 25 at module and CISPR 12 at vehicle. Basically, in military, you also have radiated emissions as the most commonly failed test, FCC. Radiated emissions is the most commonly failed test. And in automotive, the challenge uh, compared to military is, again, you've got plastic housing on almost everything. So aside from your high voltage components. So you can't take advantage of those kind of electrical bonding techniques or the shielding techniques that we mentioned earlier. So in that case is where you really have to put the focus on PCB design and stack up. Anything that you would do for signal integrity is also going to help you for EMI. Having solid ground planes never route traces over splits and ground planes. I mean, I'll say it, Ken White will say it, Rick Hartley will say it, every EMC consultant will say it. You know, always we're on the lookout for any traces routed over splits and ground planes. Uh, that would solve like fairly high percentage of EMC problems. The other thing that I like to emphasize to people is if you have a DC-DC converter, it's really easy to think that I've got DC on one side and DC on the other side. And you can get away with a lot if all you have to worry about is DC currents or DC voltages. But because of those switching operations, again, whether it's digital switching or uh, switching in a power supply, you've got high frequency noise on both sides. You have to be designing with the idea that just about every trace has higher frequency noise on it than you think. And so at that point, all the principles that come in for uh, controlling signal integrity, for making sure that you are controlling the return path of currents, giving everything solid reference planes, that's all going, that's all in a way more critical for automotive uh, than it is honestly in some aerospace applications. Yeah.